probably still am. We get to pick this apart. So perennial deniers, I call them his former skeptics, right? The perennial deniers. Uh, not necessarily entirely different. I'm still conveying the same message. There is a group of people who want to cut us that don't want us in the public school. Those have been referred to the skeptics, the ones that don't believe, the <coughs> perennial deniers, the ones that don't believe. We deny because we don't believe. We deny because we don't care. We deny because. So the perennial deniers, which exist in our schools, advanced education, the education settings that change schools to education settings, could be swayed. We could change their mind. We could sway them from being a skeptic or a denier if they consider the benefits, right? The cognitive functions or the cognitive potential. And I'm talking about that as if it was a benefit because is cognitive potential a benefit to our students that we want to emphasize and we want our students to have a chance at at our schools? Is that what schools are there for? that this curriculum, so I changed because I, I didn't want to write dance education. You know, this curriculum has on the mental faculties of students. This is not so bad. This will prevent plagiarism. This also tells you, instructor, when you're writing, or even yourself, because this is important to do, it tells them that you are, and you understand what's going on, and that you can express what the author is expressing in your words, your concepts without detracting, without taking it away. And of course, we have the in-text citation. We have a reference to Hannah in 2008. You can cheat by writing your own paper twice. You can cheat by turning in your paper twice. You can cheat if you write a paper and then you turn it into three different classes. That's plagiarism. That's self-plagiarism. It's, it's a little bit of a challenge and it might have a little bit of philosophical um, context to it. It's like, how could I cheat myself from, you know, these were my original thoughts in English 101. Now I'm taking Communication 101. <coughs> you said if these are my ideas. We've already turned that in. That was original thought. Then, according to the requirement of that assignment, now you're turning it in for credit. That is academic, a violation of academic <coughs> integrity that you don't want to be a trap of or you don't want to fall into. So don't do that. A lot of people do that because they just don't know that it is wrong. Direct quotes. This is a tricky one. Now, I bring this one up because I, I've seen many papers that you sit down to write the paper and you have all your sources, you got these great documents, excellent writers before you on an idea, right? And uh, this is what happens. You start writing and you say, okay, this sounds pretty good. Uh, I'm not going to read for understanding. I really don't have that much time because one of the number one reasons why people cheat at the university is because of lack of time. Uh, I don't have that much time. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write this article and I'm going to just fill it up to the max with according to. And this guy said, and just do that. And all of a sudden we have the kind of articles according to, and then open up one of these guys. Just copy paste because now you're safe. Half a page. Close it up. Hey, that guy said it pretty good. <laughs> Replicating it. It's here. I'm not cheating. I'm saying who said it. And then you close it up with, and that was a pretty good idea. <laughs> That's my paper. What happens sometimes is, um, we take a direct quote that may be incredibly powerful and we do something in our paraphrasing that kind of takes away from the power. So if we read this right here, President Obama suggested that Dr. King's words have a lasting and timeless relevance. Now, that doesn't sound bad, does it? Sounds pretty good. Now, when we say President Obama, okay, we're looking at a public figure, pretty powerful man. When we say Dr. King, now we're talking big business, right? <laughs> So what did Dr. King really say? And is this what the president actually said? <coughs> Let's click on that. Let's look at this. President Obama stated that Dr. King's words. Now, this right here, you can say this any better than President Obama, right? Because he can speak. And he can, I'm not sure of him. Somebody maybe is writing for him. But he does a very good job of doing this. 
So we see this in the setting. The long to the ages possessing a power and prophecy unmatched in our time. You don't want to take away from that value. This is the one that you want to wrap around in quotations, and you want to put that on your paper. And you can elaborate. You can add your thoughts to that. You can continue writing. Build up on that, but don't take away from those words. They're just too beautiful to take away. And they're too powerful and strong to take away. And there's a good chance, and you might be incredible writers, there's a good chance you may not be able to replicate that in <coughs> words. And if you try, you might take a little bit away. This is where you want to go with the quotation. I have a dream. We usually put that in quotations because I have a dream has been said, it has been said many times, and we know who owns that, right? We're going back to Dr. Martin Luther King. So make sure that we respect that. Two of the, the software solutions that we do offer provide at the university library, one is Turnitin, the other is Authenticate. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Turnitin or have used it? Okay, those of you with your hands up, did you use it in high school or here at the university? At the university. Okay, a little bit of both? Okay. So um, primarily Turnitin, as opposed to Authenticate, is going to be for classroom assignments and undergraduate work. And then Authenticate is a little bit more for researchers with their manuscripts <coughs> and grant proposals and things like that. So that's more for, for graduate students and, and faculty. But first was Turnitin. Uh, it was the first of its kind as far as plagiarism prevention software. So it's kind of the, the leading software resource for educators and students. And as Dr. Schmidt mentioned, you, you probably have some instructors that are running your papers through, or you might be submitting them directly to turn it in for your instructors <coughs> to get um, something that looks a little bit like this. Kind of tab through a bit. So this case was uh, <coughs> a professor came to me and he had two papers that looked almost identical. I think one of the students even forgot to change the name of the person that he copied. <laughs> and uh, when we put it through the, the system, you could see a lot of just word for word copying or some of the patchwork examples like, like Dr. Schmidt was talking about where it, it looked very similar to this other student's um, work. And so what's happening here with Turnitin, here's some of the numbers of of what the database from Turnitin includes, 333 mil, or excuse me, 330 million student papers have been uploaded there. So there's a good chance if if you have used one of these paper mills or copied um, your your friend that was a student at Texas Tech two years ago, if you use their paper, it could come up as a match. Um, lots of scholarly journal publications, and then a big one here, 45 billion current and archived web pages. So cutting and pasting from Wikipedia just uh, isn't going to work. And so I wanted to show you just quickly, um, well, I'll tell you what, let me go over some of these things Turnitin does not do, and then I'll show you a, a demonstration. So what Turnitin does not do, it won't catch any plagiarized text that isn't in the database. So a lot of print sources uh, won't, won't be found or student papers that haven't been submitted to turn it in. Um, it doesn't distinguish between properly cited and plagiarized text. It's, it's just going to flag it if, it if it's a match, even if it's in quotation marks, for example. And then um, it won't catch well paraphrased text. So some of those principles that we were talking about earlier, um, that wouldn't prevent uh, present a flag in the system. So. What I've got here is our university library website, library.tt.edu, and I'm going to show you how a student might submit a paper and, and what that originality report that, that you as a student and your instructors would look at, uh, how it would appear. I've gone here to library instruction, plagiarism prevention, and then I'm going to choose turn it in here. <coughs> Now there are some frequently asked question answers over here, training materials, places for instructors to request an account, but I'm just going to use the student sign-in. And Okay, and I'm going to show you a, a paper that I uploaded that was pretty blatant plagiarism. I did that intentionally. 
here's the hypothetical <coughs> class that I'm enrolled in. Now, you might notice here, one of the nice features of Turnitin is a, an overall percentage match. And I'm gonna view this report here and see what matched. So this is an example of what you as the student and what your instructor would see. Again, there's the text that I uploaded, the paper that, that I as the student sent. And then on the right here, we've got numbered and color-coded matching sources. And what's nice, let's see, is that as the instructor or the student, you can look at these sources and, and get a look at what that original text was. So you can see just how easy it is to, to uh, identify those exact <coughs> copy and paste matches. Again, that one's a, a pretty flagrant violation there. But there are some other options that, uh, again, since we're limited on time, we won't go into where you can cut out um, sources that have been put in quotation, or excuse me, text that's been put in quotations, cited appropriately. You can eliminate word matches of a certain certain number and things like that. <coughs> okay. I will say this though, one question I get all the time is, well, what percentage should I be looking for? What's, what's the magic number there? Uh, and 93, that's not a good one, let me just tell you that. But um, there's not a magic number. I know people hate hearing that. However, there can be a lot of variety. If you're doing something like a review article, a review paper, you might have a higher percentage if you're writing about um, or if you're writing about like the Bill of Rights or something where a lot of that language is, is just going to kind of be canned from, from the source or a lot of people have written about it perhaps. Um, things like reflective papers, personal reflections, hopefully that would be a very low percentage. But um, you might have a 5% match, but that 5%, somebody just copied and pasted exactly from an original source. So. Again, no magic number. Uh, it's one of those things where instructors and students both have to kind of look over the report and, and have a, to have a good view of what it's really showing. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh -huh. um, what happens if you are using, for example, laws from another country and you put them in appendix? and you just copy, you're saying that that's a law from that country, you cannot change it because it's a law, and you're putting not in your work, but in the appendix. So basically you're quoting this, this law from another country and it's part of your appendix? Yes. Um, as long as you are, are giving a citation and explaining that that's where it came from, then I think that, that would be fine. It probably would come up as a match if, if that law, for example, has been, if it's online or if it's in some other published source, However, that would certainly be a case where, where you as the author and, and the instructor would easily be able to identify that that was properly used and cited. So um, references, appendices, those kinds of things, um, it wouldn't really pose a problem as long as you're documenting correctly where that came from. Does that answer your question? Yeah, like maybe just a little paragraph saying that that, that's a lot that you can't change it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're really just inserting that that other document, and so that would be okay. Yeah. Um, I teach research and research classes. Students submit the first draft and then the final paper, and mm -hmm. it picks up on the, that number goes up because it, it sees, sees earlier the, yeah. drafts. So how yeah. is there a way around it? There is. Turnitin actually has the capability to uh, for instructors to create what's called a revision assignment instead of just the typical paper assignment. With the revision assignment, you can have multiple drafts.